manna, enge reo, enge hoi fa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Um, I'm really uh, pleased to be here, and uh, I've got three things to say, really, because I think um, most of you, many of you, would, wouldn't have been born uh, when this event happened 30 years ago. So I'd be really keen to, I don't know, to hear what you have to say, the questions you have, and, the, um, and how you sort of engage with, with what happened on the film. I think the, the film speaks for itself, the actual, the actual tour, so I'm not going to say anything about that at all. Apart from, wasn't the music really good? <laughs> 1980s, wasn't the music good? <laughs> so the tour, okay, and then so putting it into context, what did it mean for South Africa and what did it mean for New Zealand? What did it mean for, for South Africa? I think um, I went to South Africa two years ago and I was really surprised at the the impact that people said to me of the of the tour in in South Africa itself. There was a lot of effect on individuals and on the whole country. And um, the impact is summed up by Nelson Mandela, you know, um, you know that the game at Hamilton, the game that was going to be um, which was going to be played, that was the very first time there was going to be an international live telecast of a match to South Africa. And so in South Africa, people got up in the middle of the night right across the country to watch that match. And they didn't see the match they wanted to see. They saw protesters on the field, they saw the placards, and they were absolutely appalled. And they were shocked. And the emotional reaction among the white community in South Africa was quite devastating. The immediate reaction was, was of absolute fury and negativity and, and anger and frustration and how the hell could this happen? How could it happen? But over time, that worked its way through the South African system and they realized that, they, that, that the apartheid structure they had was not sustainable. And the tour was one significant factor in making that change. So in the white community, it had a devastating effect. In the black community, it was the absolute opposite. And Nelson Mandela summed it up really well. He was on Robben Island at the time. He'd been in prison for 17 years. And he said that when they heard the game had been called off, the prisoners rattled the, the, the bars on, their, on the doors of their cells right, right around the prison. And he said it was like the sun came out. Because here were people on the other side of the world taking notice of this, of this of the apartheid system and acting in, in, with a great deal of solidarity. And so it was, it was a it was a, um, a huge morale boost to, to the struggle in South Africa, to, to back South Africa. So what were the changes in South Africa? I think it, it helped to bring a quicker end to the apartheid regime. Right? We set out not to protest against the tour. We said, we're not going to protest against it. We're going to try and stop it. And that's why there were the, the, the pitch invasions which were planned and all the rest of it. Um, it was a deliberate strategy. Multiple simultaneous demonstrations when the Springboks were in one town, there would be demonstrations all the way around New Zealand at exactly the same time. We wanted to stretch the police resources, we wanted to make the tour impossible to go ahead, and we, and we got pretty close to it. So, getting back to change in South Africa, it helped to bring a quicker end to the regime. Right, the Springbok tour did go ahead, but the Springboks never left South Africa again because of the protests here in New Zealand. No other country would have them. So until apartheid was finished, Springboks couldn't leave South Africa. The, the upshot was the ANC government elected in 1994 and uh, the first democratic elections uh, in 1994. Now, the, the change that occurred was black South Africans, in fact, every South African got political rights. They got the right to vote and they got the right to, to a basic democracy. Okay? So, so civil and political rights were gained by black South Africans in 1994. But social and economic rights have not been achieved and there's an enormous struggle ahead to achieve those. Because as the situation is now, the leadership of South Africa has changed from white faces to largely black faces. But the economic structure remains absolutely unchanged. So there's been a seamless transition in the economy from oppression based on race to oppression based on, on social class. Okay? For example, if you're, um, the apartheid laws were abandoned, so the 
the Group Aries Act was abandoned. The Group Aries Act said blacks live here, whites live here, colours live here, Indians live here, right? And when those when that law was abolished, if you're a black person in a township, how do you get to live in one of those other neighbourhoods? You've got to have the income to be able to afford to buy a house or whatever. And of course the income wasn't there. So when I went to South Africa two years ago, people said to me, conditions economically are worse for the majority than they were under the old apartheid regime. And that's because the ANC adopted free market economic policies. And whenever you adopt free market economic policies, anywhere in the world, at any time, it takes wealth from the poor and gives it to the rich. That's what free markets do. And the ANC is not grappled with that. And so you've got people who were leaders of the struggle. Cyril Ramaphosa was a great leader of the struggle, Congress of South Africa Trade Unions in the 1980s. And he's now in the ANC government and he's a, he's a multi-millionaire or is he a billionaire? He owns most of the McDonald's in South Africa, you know, through franchise ownership. And um, so he became, so some of the figures, so there are now some, you know, more people in the black community have become extremely wealthy, but the majority are where they are. So civil and political rights, sorry, economic and social rights really are the ones that have to be fought for. Um, and, you know, I think, I know it's, a, it's not, a, not a popular thing to say, but I don't think history will regard Nelson Mandela as, as well as he's regarded by in, in the Western world at the moment. He would have been seen, he was a leader of the struggle. He brought political rights to black South Africans, but he did not bring economic freedoms that come with uh, everybody having a job, for example, any of that. And it's not as though, so, you know, the ANC says, well, things aren't, can't change overnight. You can't bring everybody up to a decent standard of living overnight, and that's true, you can't. But the real problem is there are no building blocks in place to give hope to black South Africans that things will change. And I think when Mandela goes, when he passes on, as he inevitably will, I think that's the point when there will be a there will be a huge turmoil in South Africa. There needs to be, and there needs to be new groups emerge to take the struggle for economic rights forward. Right, in New Zealand, now there's a really good, one of the themes that runs through this film is about racism in New Zealand. And um, Māori activists who were on, that, on, those, on the film and right through the country were saying to, to, to the anti apartheid movement, people like myself, were saying, how can you be concerned about racism in South Africa? 12,000 miles away, and you're not looking at what happens to racism in New Zealand. And, and, it's, and it's a valid criticism for, for much of the movement. It was a valid criticism. And I think the, um, what happened as a result of that was that the, um, the issues of race in New Zealand were brought to the forefront. And in the next few years, there were quite significant changes that occurred. I think the most significant change was with the Waitangi Tribunal, which was at that time, was, when it was set up in the 1970s, it could only look at future <coughs> breaches of the Treaty of Waitangi. Okay? Now, as a result of the, of this, of the Springbok tour, the, um, the enormous debate that started about racism in New Zealand, uh, within a couple of years, the government changed it so the Waitangi Tribunal could look at past at historical grievances as well. And that, that, was, that was very significant development within Look for the whole the whole of New Zealand. So it, before that, I'll just make two other points. Before that, we had um, there was a very strong, uh, well, this, or some of the people in there were involved in groups like Ngatamatoa uh, and and, um, and the Polynesian Panthers, and these groups were were raising the issue of Maori nationalism back in the in the 1960s and 1970s, and I think the whole debate in through the tour, um, gave, that, gave that movement a real impetus and pushed those issues right into the middle of the, of the Pākehā community. And it meant that New Zealand, I think, has, has progressed uh, on, to some extent, from there. There's a hell of a long way to go, though. And the very last point is, um, for me personally, I think the, the mana movement, which has begun, uh, and through, through Honi Harawa, you might say a bit more about it, through Honey Winning the by election. I think that is that provides a platform for that relationship, Māori Pākehā relationship, to move to, to a new level and to to link together the Māori nationalist struggle with the the struggle of working New Zealanders who are much 
fairer economy. And so I think that will be a really important thing for, any, for all of us to, to watch out for in the next little while. So thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you. <laughs>